So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming to today's Lunch and Learn. Um, I'll introduce my very good friend, Jenny Sison, and the reason that I'm sat here doing research as well. Um, so Jen is going to talk to us today about um, a career in research delivery, but also how to embed research into clinical um, areas as well and get people who are in a clinical role excited about research um, and hopefully make life easier for people in research delivery. So I will pass over to Jen. Thank you very much. Um, hi, everybody. Can't actually see you, so <laughs> that's probably not a bad thing, but welcome. Um, so as Kate says, I'm, um, I'm a research midwife. Um, I'm currently a research matron at Bradford Institute of Health Research at Bradford Teaching Hospitals. Um, and very recently, I've just been accepted onto the NIHR Senior Research Leader Programme. Um, so Kate just asked me to come and sort of talk about my career in research and how other people can get interested in a career in uh, research delivery. When I first started in research delivery now, it must be oh, 2009, so longer ago than I'd like to think, um, research delivery wasn't really a career as, as such. There were lots of people that went off to sort of academic careers in research and delivery was sort of seen as a, um, yeah, not a career in its own right, I don't think. And a lot has changed in that time. So I'm just coming to let you know my experience really. Um, so now after not being able to get my slides back to where they were, they now won't move on. <laughs> there we go. So that is what I look like when I'm not hot, flustered and I haven't just run halfway across the hospital to be here on time. <laughs> so I um, started off my career as a clinical midwife, started training in 1999, back in the old days. Um, and was in midwifery for a good few years before I got involved in not in research delivery but in putting together a study so I joined as a clinical midwife I was really interested in the area that they were looking at which was the management of the third stage of labour um, a, a working group that was put, sort of putting together a trial just out of interest really and it never was anything that I thought I was going to go into when I was at uni I was like let me get rid of this research academic stuff and let me at the, at the clinical practical stuff with the women um and I had absolutely no idea that being a research midwife in research delivery is actually still a very clinical role. Um, and you do spend a lot of time still with the patients that you're looking after. And, and I just loved it. I started off one day a week and then ended up going to a couple of days a week. And then I, I had a hybrid clinical role for a long time where I worked half time as a clinical midwife and half time as a research midwife. And I want to talk a little bit about that later on, because that's how the majority of our team is set up now here in Bradford. Um, and then I went on to be a senior research midwife and um, the doors that it opened, I never dreamed that I would have got involved in the things I've got involved with. Um, I've been part of the regional champion midwives group and been the co-specialty group lead for the region. And I'm now the chair for the National Reproductive Health and Childbirth uh, Research Champions um, and a research matron. So I've had a career that I never in a million years dreamed would have been possible. And I didn't even know existed when I started off in research. Maybe it didn't. <laughs> um but now I think that's the message that we're trying to get across. There's so many different ways to get involved in research. And once you are in research, there's so many different avenues to, to go down, whether or not you want to do the clinical, whether you want to do academic, whether you know, want to do a bit of a mixture. So I've just put this slide on just to sort of show that you can get involved at any level in research. Kate herself, and I'll bring you into this now, Kate, was a clinical midwife who was really interested in research while she was clinical. She wasn't a research midwife and came to us and sort of said, how can I get involved? I'm so excited by what's going on. But obviously there wasn't a clinical midwife, a research midwife post at the time. So Kate did a good clinical practice training of, of her own back and got herself on the delegation logs for some of our studies, didn't you? And you recruited as a clinical midwife, didn't you? So Oh, you're on mute, lovely. Yeah, I just think like when I think I listened to you and Diane speaking in a in a talk for the for the clinical midwives about research, and straight away I was like, "That's what I want to do. That just sounds amazing." But there was just no opportunities at that time. But anyone can get involved. You don't have to be part of the research team if you've done your GCP and you have your research training. You can, and actually, if you're sat in the clinical area, that's the best place to do the research. <laughs> so yeah. it's just an amazing time and. And yeah, and then it obviously progressed from there because when you did need someone, um, I already had that experience, which, you know, that's what led me to where I am today, really. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I've got my little picture of the clinical person with the light bulb, because I always think the people that are working on a day to day basis with the patients or the women, you know, in a clinical area are the ones that know what the problems are. And they're the ones that are closest to what research needs to happen. What what are, you know, what are causing us issues? What don't we know the answer to? So being a clinical member of staff and getting into research is is a really natural progression. And I and I don't get asked it so much anymore, but when I was just a research midwife people used to say to me don't you miss being a real midwife and I'd be like what about this is not being a real midwife you know you come into midwifery because you want to advocate for women and, and give them the best care that you can and we don't know what the best care is without the research to sort of either back up the practice that we're doing or to give us new evidence to change practice and actually you know working on a labour ward and looking after the women that you look after that day you go home and think, oh I've made a difference to her today I've done a good job and that's you know what gave me the job satisfaction but actually in research when you're finding out a, a trial finding or a new medicine or something that you need to do that makes people safer you're not just affecting those women that you're looking after that day but you're making it better for everybody from then on so it's just completely a different level of job satisfaction and you know that you're affecting the bigger picture not just what's happening on a day-to-day basis so I do absolutely I'm a staunch advocate for the fact that I'm still a midwife <laughs> um, there's loads of ways for clinical staff to get involved as well there's something called the associate principal investigator scheme so that's developed for clinical staff to learn how to um, to sort of go behind the scenes on a research study and, and see how it runs and what a PI needs to do and, and sort of how all the moving parts fit together. So that's something, again, that clinical staff can do to start getting involved and seeing, putting the toe in the water, really. Is it something that they like and do they, you know, do they want to do that? And then also the NHR gives absolutely all sorts of ways of going into um, being a researcher rather than research delivery. So there's loads of different career pathways so if you're interested, the NHR website is a really good place to look for things like that. And they've now got their own nurse in a midwifery site as well. So that's specifically about um, research for nurses, midwives and a, um, there will be AHPs soon. So that's a really good place to have a look. If you sort of, this, this piques your interest, then have a look on there or reach out to me or Kate or somebody that's, um, you know, that's around and that can maybe help point you in a different direction. So one um, bit that we sort of decided that we'd talk about today is how to embed research in clinical practice. So I've got Bradford as my frame of reference because that's where I've worked for a really long time. And we um, we have managed, I think, quite well to, to embed research within the clinical team, within the clinical workforce. And we, you know, we all walk around on the lay board now. People quite often say, what are we doing next? What's coming now? You know, what are the new studies? And this this group here is midwives, um, clinical midwives, research midwives who've all worked on what's um, a study that's just closed called the Group B Strep 3 study, which was looking at testing women for Group B Strep in the pregnancy. And our unit got randomised to every woman that walked through the door in labour was offered a test for this Group B Strep. So there's absolutely no way in the world that the research team could have delivered that by themselves. It took every single member of the clinical staff on the maternity assessment centre, on the um, induction of labour suite, on the labour ward, to all know about the study. And in fact, the whole unit, because afterwards the postnatal ward midwives needed to know if the, you know, if the women had tested positive and things. So the whole unit had to change their practice. And as, a, and as a unit, we hit our target for that study, which was something that there's just no way we would have done without research being embedded in practice. So um, the ways that we've sort of done that is, I say, engage the clinical workforce. A lot of them are already really excited. And one of these quotes is from one of our doctors who sort of said, it's so exciting working in a unit that's part of cutting edge research. And I think that really shows how the clinical staff have got um, the they're there as well because they want the best outcomes for the patients that they're looking after. So they've a lot of them, once they understand what it is that research does, have also got a vested interest in making sure that the projects run well. Um, that midwife there's part of how research helps us give better care. And someone once said to me, it's helping, our, you know, it, it helps the women now and it helps our daughters and our daughters' daughters and it makes, you know, it makes that impact moving forwards. So having an engaged clinical workforce and being able to deliver these research studies means we'll get better uh, better evidence but also it means better opportunities for women to take part in studies i'm saying women lot sorry it's because i'm a midwife but patients if you're ringing from a non-maternity background 
there's lots of evidence that shows that patients that have their care in research active hospitals have better outcomes. And I always say, Kate's heard me say this a million times, but if there was anything else we could do in somebody's care that we knew increased their odds of a better outcome, it would just be a no brainer that we would do it. And research is one of those things, you know, it's, it's been proved that patients that have care in a research active hospital have better outcomes. And actually people that take part in research have better outcomes. And we tend to be like a little team of audit people along the side of, along the side of someone's care. They know us, they see the same small team again and again. And we are through those notes with a fine tooth comb because we have to put so much data into the systems when people take part in a study. So we'll be putting all the data in and think, oh, no one's done a iron count for a little while. That's been missed. Or why is that scan been booked then? Because it's at the wrong dates. So we quite often will improve their clinical care or find where things have fallen through the gaps because we've got such an in-depth knowledge of those women and their care. So increased opportunities for the women doesn't just make things better in the long term but it makes things better for that person there and then and you know a lot of people go into a trial where they might we might not change the care and we're just collecting the data for outcomes but we can still manage to influence it by finding out those little things that might have been missed or by being a, a person that the women know because quite often they'll ring us and say I didn't you know didn't want to ring my midwife because she's really busy but <laughs> and then ask us things and you know when we can then signpost them back into the the service wherever they need to be um, it means that the trials are delivered successfully so that we get um, the right amounts of people able to take part. And then it means that we can integrate research into everyday care, because I think one of the big things with when new research findings come out, and there's a lot of evidence that's shown it takes a really long time from finding out something in a study works to it actually becoming part of everyday care. Guidelines need changes, SOPs need changes. Somebody needs to find the evidence and take it to a meeting to discuss it. Do they change it? You know, and it takes quite a long time for that to happen. If you've run a study in your unit, like we just have with Group B Strep 3, if that study is then found to work and we need to implement that to make care better for women, we've got a clinical team that are already used to delivering the swabs. They're used to managing the machine and cleaning the machine. We've got a team that's used to um, ordering all the supplies and we've already got all of that set up with procurement. So it's so much easier to integrate research back into the clinical care if you've got a team that have been involved in delivering it in the first place. And actually they've put a lot of hard work into that. So quite often they'll be, have we got any results yet? What was it shown? What's it found? What do we need to do differently? So you've got people already interested and motivated to, to make the change in the care as well. Um, and those sort of little study pictures down the bottom of this one are studies that, that stick out in my mind as being ones that have changed the care um, or while they were running specifically change the care in our unit um i know there was a study that was looking at whether or not we should give women antibiotics after having an operative vaginal delivery so um, like a forceps or a von tooth. we knew that those women were more at risk of getting an infection more at risk of group a strep which could make them really poorly but we didn't actually do anything different for those women and any women that had cesareans were already given prophylactic antibiotics but that group of women we didn't do anything different so the study was brought in and the women were offered to take part and they either got a placebo or they got a one-off dose of antibiotics within uh, six hours of having had the baby and that protocol landed on my desk and I thought oh my goodness me how are we going to do this women all have just had the baby that's the point where they want to know how much does it weigh is it a girl or a boy they want to tell all the family they might need stitches they've got you know there's a million and one things to do and then we've got to walk in and start talking about a study <laughs> you know do they want this extra medication and things and a lot of them we gave information to beforehand but still they had to make the decision there and then and I don't think the research team would have done a very good job of delivering that study by ourselves because it would just have been completely impractical to get in there in time but our whole labour ward got on board with that one all the registrars were trained and able to take consent and able to prescribe the medication and all the midwives were trained and they approached the women that they'd been caring for for all that time and spoke to the, you know, spoke to them about the study. They got the consent. They gave the medication. They filled in all the forms. And me and Kate used to wander in on a Monday morning and found that three people had been randomised into the study and everything had been done. And we just needed to send the forms off on a Monday morning. And it was the clinical team that did the vast majority of those recruits to that study, and not the research team. And that's the beauty of having it, you know, so embedded. So how we did it 
Um, and I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, I did this and this is an absolute team effort and this is something that was brought in by my predecessors. You know, I've sort of picked it up and carried on and now handed it over to somebody else. So it's 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 the culture, I think, within our maternity unit that makes the difference. And that's something that you can you can impact quite easily. We, um, we make sure we're really visible. We've got a research uniform. We go to the wards and to clinics and we go every day. We have a walk around. We get to know the staff that are working down there. We make sure that they know about the studies and we, um, you know, we make sure that we're around a lot. I think sometimes thinking about research can be a bit scary if you're a clinical staff member and you think, oh gosh, could that person go in that study? Absolutely no idea. I'm not going to do anything. Whereas if they know us and they see us around, they can say, oh, what do you think could this you know could this person take part in that study so being part of the wider team and being visible really makes a big difference um, and we're really integrated with the team so like I, I was saying before we have got a, um, a big chunk of our team that work in hybrid in a hybrid way so our research midwives are seconded from being clinical midwives in the unit so part of the time they work clinically and part of the time they work in research so when they're on the labour ward in their you know, in the blues with the research hat firmly not on, people will still think, oh, this, I wonder if this person could go in the study. Ooh, Kate's over there. Can I just ask you about this? So it's having somebody on hand that is there, you know, clinically as well as with research. But also when the new protocol comes and lands on your desk and you've got to think, could we run this in our unit? Does it fit with our care pathways? Are we going to be able to approach women at such and such a time to take part in this study? They absolutely know the answers because they're doing it all day, every day in their other job. So it's, and they can quite often say that won't work because of X, Y, and Z, or that's going to be really difficult for the clinical staff. So we can't do it that way. We need to think of another way. So it means that when we're doing integrate the studies it we do it in the easiest way possible um and my favorite one is like get yourself on the agenda just get yourself everywhere any meeting that you can turn up pat and shout your little uh, research <laughs> to the horn for research um and i think communicating the why is really really key so something that um kate again you got roped into all sorts didn't you kate and i again in the pandemic we worked on some training for newly qualified midwives because one of my bugbears is when you're a student and you do your research module and you end up doing a systematic review or um, looking at how to critically appraise a paper, what what I never got, and I don't know whether or not hopefully that is changing and I think it is and slowly and it will do, but we never got the, the, the clinical side of things. It was always the academic, complicated, quite dry bit of research. And I always think, oh, gosh, not research. But now I realise, you know, it's just a big circle. You don't get the new papers and the evidence to integrate into practice without the women that you're actually caring for in the clinical environment taking part in the studies in the first place. So it's absolutely crucial to have the research delivery staff with the women clinically to give them, or patients, I mean, give them the opportunity to take part in the study at the time. And then that feeds into giving you the new uh, the new evidence. So if at university you just do the academic sort of you know what I would think of as the more dry bit of research when you come out into clinical practice you're not going to see it as a fundamental part of your role because it hasn't been a fundamental part of your training so I'm really keen that we get student placements up and running that we get people involved early on and we're massive advocates for saying come and do some spoke hours with us come and spend a couple of days with us see what it is that we do and and you know and see that side of things and then hopefully we'll get the students at least interested or aware of what's going on and then when people start as midwives they'll realize that they don't have to be a research midwife to be interested in research and actually to integrate research as part of their role so a big bit of the why really is it's part of the code to start with anybody that's working as a nurse or midwife as you know has got to practice in line with the best available evidence and there is no best available evidence if we don't do the research to produce it so it's absolutely key as part of all of our roles to make sure that we support research that's happening um and this paper i mean it's getting on a bit now i think it might have been from 2017 but this systematic review was really interesting for us from a maternity perspective because it showed that participation in clinical trials improved the outcomes in women's health so like I said before, women taking part in studies have better outcomes. It's absolutely crucial that the clinical staff know that information because then, you know, if you are, as most of us are in, in clinical 
roles at wanting to, be, to, you know, to give the best care and give that person the best opportunity, the best outcomes, the best experience. It needs to be part of our role to make sure that we let them know if there's any research that they can take part in. It's part of the NHS constitution is that we will offer patients the chance to take part in any research that they might be eligible for. Well, how do we even know if, you know, if we're not if we're a clinical member of staff that doesn't know what research is happening? And also the women's health strategy as well for, uh, for England. There's loads of strategies and I wasn't going to bore you with a big thing of strategies, but the understanding the why it's important, I think is a massive um a massive help for getting people on board. Um, it's part of the CQC. So there's direct correlation between an NHS Trust's clinical trial activity and the mortality rates and the CQC ratings. So research makes care better, quite clear from that. So the CQC have um, added research into their well-led framework now so it's question eight that's how much of a loser i am i know that it's question eight of the cqc plus well-led reports where they want to come and see what's happening from a research perspective in hospitals so these are their prompts i don't know how new it is now but i think it's only the last couple of years are divisional staff aware of research do they know you know what's happening in the trust and do they know that it contributes to improvement how do the senior leaders support research within the trust and does the vision and the strategy of the organisation have research in it? These are all things that the CQC can look at. So how are patients and carers given the opportunity to participate in or become involved in the studies? So they can wonder in and the CQC assesses and think, right, where's the research information? How would, if I was a patient, how would I know what my options were? How do I get in touch with the research team? So really everybody that works within your trust should know, not even if they don't know what studies you're running, I need to, you know, I know the research team, I could put you in touch with them if anybody asks. So that's really key, I think, for people to know that it's so part of care and it is now assessed as part of um, care. And then we, we try and make it fun wherever we can. So these are two of our marvellous uh, Labour Ward coordinators here pointing at a picture of Free Willy. And I'm going to blame you for this, Kate. <laughs> but we had a study called Will. Um, and as part of letting everybody know the study was running and what it was for we created or Kate created um, a competition so we had 10 different pictures of various wills around our maternity unit so we'd got Prince William and Free Willy and Will Smith and Wilbur the Pig and we hid them all over the maternity unit and then did a competition for them to take a selfie put it on our internal secure um, maternity Facebook group and everybody that did uh, got in entered into a prize and we pulled you know we pulled the winner out at the end and I think they probably got some free pens and stuff you know it wasn't big stuff but it just got everyone talking about it it was fun you know they've got really really stressful tiring hard jobs and something like that just adds a little bit of light light humor to it and we had so many of the staff that were finding them and then rehiding them from someone else and it just got the whole unit talking about the study but in a fun way we would never have been able to walk onto a ward and make it, it that fun but then everybody knew what it was what it was about and which women you know we needed to take part so i think if you can find a way of making it fun for people it's absolutely worth doing um education as well we um like i said turn up on every agenda you can possibly find we um we try and get a slot on our mandatory training days for the um midwives so that we can let them know what the current studies are you, you know, inclusion and exclusion criteria for studies are quite often really big you can't expect somebody even in research often to remember all of those things but you can go and say we've got this study running and it's looking for people with this condition or we've got this one running and we need to approach these people and then at least if people are aware, when they're clinical and they see a woman come in and this happens, they can think, oh, I'll ring the research team because I don't know whether this person might be able to take part in that study. And if you can train your clinical staff to know that, then you don't have to be everywhere in all places of your maternity unit to catch every person that walks through the door because the clinical staff do it with you and for you and, you know, it's a joint effort. We get ourselves in the inductions again for the midwifery and the medical staff so that right at the start we can sort of say we are a research active hospital, we've got a real active research culture, these studies are all running um, and this potentially will be part of your role. And then we offer training so we do sort of drop in sessions so people can come and find out more. So we don't just say you need to know this and then wander off, you know, the, the door's always open for people to come and say I've heard about this study but just run through me, with me what again that it is that I'm looking for. Um, we created a newly qualified midwives induction package, which we did in COVID. Um, 
and delivers of online webinars. And these little Mentimeter things at the side were what we did beforehand. So we asked everybody, what three words would you use to describe research? And these were newly qualified midwives coming out straight into practice. And that was the, the, the results we got from one session, complicated, difficult, time consuming. And there are interesting and vital and stuff on there as well. But a lot of the feedback that we got was, oh, it's not for me. I mean, I've done that session a few times now and I've had yawn, boring, not for me, complicated, you know, and it, there is that real thought when people come out sometimes, oh God, research is just not my bag. Um, but actually, by the time we'd done that session and we asked people to rate what their thoughts were afterwards, we were getting things like important, interesting, essential, you know, and sometimes you do still get, still not for me, which is fair enough. But if you, if, you know, we've, if we can make that difference to a group of people within 45 minutes of just telling them what the clinical research delivery side of, of research looks like and why it's part of their role, then absolutely worth doing. We, uh, we got a uh, shortlist for Nursing Times Award, didn't we, for that one as well, which was very exciting, but we didn't win. Um, so student placements, again, we... Um, we always offer student placements and we'll do the odd spoke placement where there might be a student that's out on a clinical area and they just pop down for a day or sometimes we arrange for them to come and do a whole research placement and then get them um, the odd day here and there we've got a patient recruitment centre so that's a, um, a specific centre to try and embed uh, commercial research quickly um, and at big scale within the NHS so they can go and spend a bit of time with this PRC team if they want to and you know just get a flavour for what happens in other areas um, and we lecture, we go turn up at the uni and do this kind of thing and sort of try and get our enthusiasm and passion across to people. We do uh, teaching sessions and then, like I said, the one-to-one -one training and the drop-in. So I think a big part of getting a culture within the unit is just being visible and being there to answer people's questions and sort of try and impart your knowledge. So we pop up on our maternity Facebook as well and sort of let everybody know, oh, this was the this is what happened with that trial or we've finished that thank you very much for all of your help and we managed to hit the target and we'll let you know when we get any results and just keep them updated and, and make sure that they they feel and that they know they are absolutely a valued part of the whole team it's not whenever I go and speak at conferences and stuff about what we've done here or it's it's not the research team that I sort of say have been successful it's absolutely the unit because it just would not happen without everybody getting involved um Oh, and that led me right nicely onto that slide. <laughs> and I'm not even prepared that. Um, just we're really keen on valuing the involvement of people. We know that they've got really busy, complicated jobs. They might be desperate for a wee. They've not been for hours. They've got loads of people to look after. And then they still manage to ring us and say, would you come down and speak to this woman? So we had these little thank you cards made where we can write a little message and just acknowledge that they've taken the time out and to um, help their women get access to research or if they've helped us with um I don't know some data collection or something like that and that's also something that they can then use for their revalidation and in a little sneaky way it made me think well actually if people are going to put that as a thank you in the revalidation then when they reflect about it they're going to have to reflect about how research is really important so it kind of fulfills two angles um, and we're always trying to sort of go back to people and give them certificates for taking part, um, you know, and then helping their studies so that they get something back as well. Because we're always on the lookout, aren't we, for something else to put in our portfolio for a bit of feedback. So anything you can do to make uh, people feel like you really do appreciate them doing it. And this slide's a bit cringe, but I've put it in because I... Um, I've sort of come to learn now in this job that you just have to ignore the cringe factor and get yourself wherever you can to raise the profile. So never in a million years when I started doing research did I ever think I'd end up doing all of this. But I've done filming for YouTube. I was on uh, Panorama with Stacey Dooley, which was probably one of the most nerve-wracking things of my life. But that gave us a section on primetime telly to go and talk about how important research is in practice and how the outcomes of research immediately impacted on the care that we were giving to the women so it was just too good an opportunity to turn down even though it made me feel a little bit sick um and like i mentioned we've been nursing times award before so if you are doing research you know get yourself in for awards and things like that it raises a profile and it lets everybody else know just how important it is um and actually, the Stacey doing the documentary got um, uh, nominated and won a Royal Television Society Award. So that was a very exciting, swanky night. 
don't expect a posh bot when you uh, when you go into a clinical role, do you? Um, and another thing that really helps or that we found really helps is sort of regional and national collaboration. So if there's opportunities for you to get involved with things within your region or nationally, absolutely do it. There's a group, um, and this is a maternity related, um, a, well, gynae maternity related group where research champions from each of the regions get together on a national basis and share good ideas. And when I say share good ideas, I mean, we pinch each other's good ideas. Somebody once said to me, <laughs> You don't reinvent the wheel, you just pinch it and add spokes. And I thought that's a really, that's a really good way of putting it because there's just no point in doing something again from scratch if someone else is already doing it. But likewise, other people have some brilliant ideas. So we've got some colleagues down in South London who do a research exchange program. So they've got some big units within their patch that have got huge research teams. And then they've got other units within the patch that have got maybe one research midwife or haven't got a research team. And they do exchange programs so that staff can come in and work with them from other units to see what it is that, you know, that research does and how, what a career in research delivery looks like and, and sort of to pass that knowledge on. So somebody comes up with a good idea and then that's absolutely something that you can you can bring bring in. So we've done quite a lot of that. So if you're a clinical member of staff in a unit where there isn't a, much going on, you think, I'm really interested in research, but there isn't really much happening in my hospital. How can I even get any experience? Throw your, cast your net a bit wider, find somebody that, that does it somewhere else and quite often they'll be more than happy for you to go and spend a bit of time with them and to explain what you've done and we've actually had some people do that and then move from those teams back into their unit and set up research with their support so um, and we've we've done that within our unit where we'd got um the whole maternity portfolio was set up by a pediatric research nurse who I used to go and help set up and she came across to us and saw how we do it. So there's, you know, sometimes it's about thinking outside of the box and using whatever, whatever support you can get. The, uh, the NIHR is a really network um, focused organisation and generally people are really happy to sort of help you. And obviously we have a newsletter where we share good news from all around the region as well. Um, so I've fired through that, haven't I? Got 35 minutes so now we've got quite a lot of questions if anybody's got any <laughs> that's great thanks so much Jen and that's if anybody wants to get hold of me because I've promised <laughs> I've promised to help if anybody wants to send it in any right directions then um, if I can help I absolutely will that's great has anyone got any questions for Jen after all that No one's admitting it. I've stunned, stunned everyone into yeah, stunned everyone, Jen. <laughs> I think I think that's what we've dis we've discussed quite a lot is is the clinical staff a lot of the time just don't understand research delivery, and we've had we've put jobs out before for a research midwife and we've spoken to clinical colleagues, and we've said, "Oh, you're going to go for it," and they've gone, "Oh, I'm not clever enough," and it's like, "Oh no, you don't actually you're not doing the research. You are, you know, you're on the ground going and getting those women to and." our patients you know it's not just maternity and putting them in the studies which is the most important bit because the research re researchers can't do their job without us um so sam's got her hand up i'll pass over to sam thanks kate uh, thanks uh, jenny it's not a question it's just to say thank you i think we're going to have this available recorded aren't we to inspire our midwives and nurses and allied health across the region so it was just to say thank you i think how you've laid it out was really informative and inspiring so yeah thanks Oh, thank you. Well, I can't take credit. Like I say, it's a big old team effort, but I've uh, just been the person that shared it with everybody. <laughs> I think it little... just demonstrates, sorry, I was going to say, I think it just demonstrates research capacity building. And this is a step in and it might be a, a platform for people to then do their own research. So I don't think we should rule that out either. Um, but I think it's a really yeah. positive thing to get involved in undergraduate and then postgraduate um, status. So I think it's something we can all learn from and share across the region and consider how it works in each organisation. Yeah. So thank you. Absolutely. And we've, I mean, Kate specifically gave me the brief of research delivery. So that's the, the road I went down. But we've had members of our team who've done a master's while they've worked with us. Um, in, in fact, my predecessors, quite a lot of them went off to do NHR fellowships and professorships and things like that. So we... And, you know, we and Kate have had this conversation before. If you're wanting to get into being a, an academic researcher, then quite often dipping your toe in the research delivery world, if that's e more easily accessible at the time, it's a really good way of starting because you learn what makes a good study from the delivery elements of it. 
So we've quite often worked with academics from universities that have come and said to us, right, I've set out this study. This is what I'd really like to do. Can you give us some you know, advice? And we've looked and said, well, it's a good idea, but you're never going to get a urine sample off every person at 17 weeks of pregnancy because we don't see them at that point. So really, it'd be good to do that at 20. Or, you know, when you're designing a study, you don't necessarily know the minutiae of what the clinical care pathway looks like. And that's why it's really key to have somebody from a research delivery role, I feel, on a grant when they're putting studies together because they can give that absolutely invaluable insight and the, the women's feedback as well. Or oh, sorry, I keep saying women because it's I'm so programmed to it as a midwife. But um, you know, the, the patient's feedback as well. Is it going to be something that they want to take part in and that kind of uh, that kind of thing? Lovely. Um, Joanna. Hi, yeah. Thanks, Jen. So I'm Jo Smith. I'm professor of um, nursing at Sheffield Children's and Sheffield Hallam University, and obviously part of my role is to try and engage people in research. So if you take, I've got loads of questions because some of mine mirror Sam's. <laughs> Sorry about that. So if you to say what would be the top top one or two things that you've done that really have made a difference for people being enthused or wanting to engage in research, what would they be? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I think probably. Um, the visibility in the clinical areas of a research team because it makes it seem a lot less yeah. alien um, and I know definitely for those big hard hard to run sort of labour world mm -hmm. studies that we've run they would I don't think we'd have ever yeah. got them off the ground if we didn't have um, if we didn't have people around and visible and you know mm. we've done things like one of our studies was called respite and it was looking at remifentanil instead of pethidine for women in labor but it meant that they needed one-to-one -one care constantly all the time no one was ever allowed to leave the room mm. so that obviously our labor would be like it's just what <laughs> mm. you know if they need covering for breaks not only have we lost that midwife all the time but then whoever's covering them for the breaks also out you know that that's gonna be really difficult from a clinical point of view um so we as a research team, because we've all got that clinical background, just used to run and cover breaks for them and things. So it was, I think they see that it moves back, you know, that you can um, move back with a forward, you can help them. If we go down and it's absolutely manic on a clinical day, we'll say we're here, you know, um, we're not gonna we're not gonna try and chat mm -hmm. to you. We can see that you're horrendously busy, you know, and I've quite often does anybody need a brew making? You know, it's mm -hmm. something that I can do in five minutes that's gonna make a big difference to their mm -hmm. day. And I think it's keeping those relationships. So that'd be my first one. And my second one probably is um I think the the sort of the education about the why and yeah. Yeah. what difference it makes. Cause I don't mm -hmm. think when mm -hmm. I came into research I had any idea of the impact it has day to day on the patients that take part mm -hmm. and also I mean obviously you qualify with a know that you've got mm -hmm. to do evidence day evidence based practice mm -hmm. and that's just absolutely drummed into you from the start of your nursing midwifery mm -hmm. whatever it is career um but I don't think I appreciated mm -hmm. how beneficial it can be to people to actually be in the studies mm -hmm. So my other question is, isn't what I actually put my hand up for, but you've made me really think <laughs> in, in the Sam's comments as well. So I really think that um, the, the clinical delivery research nurses are, have got a mass amount to offer, and you've given some really nice examples of that. But what I always wonder is, what why isn't that leading to them to be um co-investigators or on applications in your experience in your team has it led to them being invited to be on um, funding applications because what I see is that expertise being used but it doesn't really translate into raising the profile of nurses and midwives and AHPs so they've got that knowledge skills but they're still not being in a way I'll just use the word rewarded or yeah. being put on um, bid teams? Yeah, so um, yes and no. I, I've i been approached and I've been a co-applicant on bids previously because they've wanted my time mm. for stuff like this. Um, and my the other people that I've worked with has definitely have done. Um, I think some of it's a sort of a bit of a, um, of a cheeky ask back. If people are wanting to use your knowledge, then, mm. yeah, you yeah. know, you can yeah. sort of say, well... Mm. You, 
you know, can we be part of the bid and realistically, if mm -hmm. we're doing all of this, even mm -hmm. if it's just a case of being acknowledged on the paper when it comes out that you've yeah. done, you've done that work. Mm -hmm. um, we had a, a anaesthetic student doctor come and work with us on a study for a little bit and they were so keen they got GCP trained and we'd got them trained on the trial delegation log and they did some consenting um, and they were acknowledged on the paper as part of the team because yeah. obviously that was a nice start to mm -hmm. their career um, I think one of the reasons why it potentially doesn't always translate into people getting involved in the academic side of it is because they don't want to <laughs> so um my my predecessor was very much into um this she went off she was an academic um really mm. successful associate professor and I think she always wanted me to follow in her footsteps but actually it's the delivery that really mm. buys my passion you know mm. that's what floats my mm. boat and that it, it, I, yeah I think some of it is, is quite a yeah. different career and yeah. people don't necessarily want to lose the contact that they have with the the women mm. and the patients on the day-to-day and I think that's that's a, a good rationale, but I often sometimes think that we're not recognised as a group or invited or offered those opportunities. So I think that's... Uh, really, I'll talk forever, so just shut me up when you're ready. <laughs> um, to, to get rid of me. <laughs> oh, no, thank you for your questions. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll I, complete, you now. <laughs> um, I completely agree, though, Joe. It's something Jen and I have spoken mm -hmm. about before. And I think there's still loads of work to do. And I don't know who needs to do this work, but making mm -hmm. academics at a university that aren't in the NHS just aware of us mm -hmm. and aware that we're there mm -hmm. to. But, and yeah. like, like Jen said before, if someone's thinking of doing something on a labor ward, we want them to come to us when mm -hmm. they're writing their pro when they're writing their protocol. We don't want to have to go yeah. back to them when they've already got a mm -hmm. protocol that then we say mm -hmm. isn't going to work. Um so I think it is mm -hmm. probably thinking about how we yeah. how the even if it's the mm. nhr the, the crn mm. sort of relay mm -hmm. that message to academics and to trial units to say mm. you know are you getting mm. your actual research delivery teams on board because they're the experts mm. and like mm. jen says it's a career in its own right now mm. it's expertise that research mm. delivery staff have that other people don't mm. and it yeah. should be used and it should be on applications mm. But I don't think it's just academics, is it? Because um, quite a lot of, of trials are, are, are run by probably medics, and I don't know if it's still that hierarchy yeah, yeah. where medics just don't necessarily perceive to invite nurses, AHPs to join bid teams. Some do. We're not. I'm not saying everybody, but I do look at some of the work that's been done and think there'd be a real role for some of the nurses to actually lead some elements of it, particularly if they're evaluating a trial. Yeah, so some there's some more qualitative side of it. There's some work that Claire Pye has done. I don't know if you know Claire Pye. She was... Um... She worked in Sheffield, actually, she doesn't anymore, but she's published um, a paper on clinical research nurse and midwife as an integral member of the trial management team yeah. because she had a role that was, she was written into the bids for the grants as a clinical research person that was part of that, you know, of that grant so and she's really passionate about saying, you know, that we need to have a seat at the table when these bids are put together yeah, so yeah. Um, I, I can find the paper and send that on to you oh, if you yes, want. that's, that's a, a, you know, that Sheffield Born and Bread paper, that one can... Thank you, and um, that would be really handy Well, we've got um, Gail's got her hand up Good afternoon, thanks Jen that was really uh, interesting talk um, I'm Gail Mills, I'm um, Executive MAP for the CRN, so I just wanted to pick up on the conversation around um, nurses and other AHPs and midwives being involved in um, feasibility stage. So Ruth Endicott, as uh, Director for Nursing and Midwifery, has just piloted um, a process whereby you can volunteer to look at feasibility review at yeah. grant, grant stage. So I think there is a knowledge that there's a lot to offer from MAPs at that point yeah. in time. So. I'll try and promote and share that, those kind of opportunities when they come out. That'd be great, thank you. We, um, as a champions group, obviously we, we're very much our H and C based, but we um, we're now being asked by big national sponsors for studies to have a you know to be integrated as part of their protocols as they put them together. So they come and meet with us as a as a whole national group and bring their protocol and say what do you think is this going to work would you do anything differently and and then hopefully they then come out to us and land on our desks and we think yep 
we can get that one up running. So it, I think it is starting to happen more, isn't it? That's great. Well, I've just checked the chat. There's no um, questions in the chat unless anyone wants to put anything in. Just lots of good feedback, Jen, which I will share oh, with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so is any of oh, the sort of last chance now to um, ask any more questions for Jen? Otherwise, we will we'll end this a little bit early so everyone's got a little bit more of their lunch. No, I think that's lovely. Well, thank you ever so much for coming. Um, like I said before, um, in the chat, I think um, it's still there. Um, there should be the link to our ARC newsletter, our ARC website, and also the YouTube channel because this will be recorded and put on that channel um, so you can share it with any colleagues that didn't come today. So thank you very much. Have a lovely rest of your day. And thanks, Jen. Thank you.